afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Brian Lane with Sensing Nature. On behalf of Gene Murphy and myself, we want to present to you this Nature Cast. This is our a new programs that we're doing here with Sensing Nature. It's where we bring on guest speakers, come in and talk about various subjects. Today we're going to be talking about sustainable seafood and climate change. We have two great guest speakers, Dr. Laney and Dr. Smith. They each given their their piece, and also we're giving a little twist on this today too. We're having our interns who helped a, a, a great amount to try to bring this all together and arrange for our speakers. So Jaya and Alyssa are going to be giving our, our introductions to our guest speakers. So I hope you enjoy the program and thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you for joining Sense of Nature and NatureCast. Thanks, Ian Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa. And like they said, I'm an intern at Sensing Nature. I'm a senior at Emory University majoring in environmental science, and quick fun fact about me, I'm a butterfly enthusiast and have worked with a butterfly sanctuary for three years. Now I'll pass it off to my friend and fellow intern, Jaya. Hello, my name is Jaya and I'm also an intern with Sensing Nature. I'm a junior at Emory studying environmental science, and a fun fact about me is that I am a bird nerd. I volunteered as an avian education steward in a birds of prey program for three years. We want to thank you so much for being with us today for our first NatureCast event, Sustainable Seafood and Climate Change Connections. We will get started in just a minute, but first I would like to remind everyone to keep your cameras off during the speaker presentations and put all your questions in the chat. We have two very special guests today, Dr. Laney of North Carolina State University and Dr. Smith of University of Florida. Dr. Laney completed all of his studies in North Carolina, receiving his PhD at North Carolina State University in zoology. He is currently an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University, and also serves on the board of directors of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. His latest research involves tagging and tracking migratory Atlantic striped bass in order to assess the vitality of the species, especially in the wake of climate change. He served on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for almost 38 years, and his passion and dedication of his work has earned him the North Carolina Conservationist of the Year Award in 2019. Today, Dr. Laney will be focusing his presentation on wild, stick on wild fish stocks and sustainable fisheries management. So we're going to hear from Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is an assistant professor of biogeochemistry in the Department of Soil and Water Sciences at the University of Florida. Before joining the Tropical Research and Education Center, she was a postdoc at the University of Kansas and a David H. Smith Conservation Fellow at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. She has a PhD in marine science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Smith's research includes aspects of biogeochemistry, microbial ecology, and marine ecology. Dr. Smith has a strong background in nitrogen cycling and shellfish aquaculture, and is currently investigating the effects of climate variability and sea level rise on biogeochemistry of South Florida's coastal habitats in order to increase public awareness. Today, Dr. Smith will be focusing on shellfish aquaculture and its environmental be benefits. Please welcome Dr. Smith. Then, okay, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, I just also wanted to give some of my information here. Uh, I do have a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, so we do have a little North Carolina connection going on for us today. Uh, but now that I live in Florida, I think a lot more about climate change and sea level rise. And although that's not going to be the focus of my talk today, uh, it's something that I will be happy to answer questions for or about. So enough about me. Let's get to the real, ooh, sorry about that. Let's get to the real star of our show, oysters. I think, uh, I like oysters. I love to eat oysters. I love everything about oysters, but I know that that's not how everybody feels. So usually when I give this talk, I ask people, how many of you eat oysters? And people can raise their hands. Since we're virtual, we can't do that. <laughs> so what I would say from most of my past experience is that probably get about 50% of people will eat oysters and the other 50% won't eat them. Uh, and then everyone asks me, yes, I do eat oysters, even though I also study them. Oh, I can't, here we go. 
went too fast. This is a quote from Hemingway that I just kind of love. It really captures what I think about oysters. As I ate oysters and their strong taste of the sea and their faint metallic taste that the cold white wine washed away, leaving only the sea taste and the succulent texture. And as I drank from their cold liquid from each shell and washed it down with that crisp taste of wine, I lost the empty feeling and I began to be happy and to make plans. This is exactly how oysters feel for me. Uh, they gave Hemingway life. I, they give me life. I get excited to study them. They are food for all of us, a high quality protein source. And there's something about having that oyster, even though it's like weird and slimy and maybe not so visually or texturally appealing, that still has a lot of joy. It can bring joy to our plates and joy to the way that we work in the environment. So our history with oysters in the US is long. Uh, this quote describes some of the first oysters that the European settlers saw when they came into the, the first colonies. Uh, they were actually described oysters and oyster reefs that they form as navigational hazards because there were so many. Writing back to Europe, they, the first settlers wrote, the abundance of oysters is incredible. There are whole banks of them so that many ships must avoid them. They surpass those in England by far in size. Indeed, they are four times as large. So oysters are not unique to the US. We, they have oysters in Europe and in Asia, but our oysters are special because they're Chrysostra virginica or the Eastern oyster. It's a different species of oyster. And these oysters grow a little differently than other oysters around the world. Uh, and when the European settlers came, they saw them relatively untouched. So these oysters had been growing in the waterways around the US uh, for a long time, just growing, filtering, and building reefs and reefs and reefs, making them uh, consider these navigational hazards. There were so many oysters uh, that they quickly became part of, our Amer of the American culture. Uh, still think of oysters today we have you can probably think of many oyster bars in your own neighbor uh your own towns and neighborhoods there were so many oysters originally here that they were actually used as currency uh and in the structure of many houses like in savannah and charleston walls after they were eaten there were so many oysters that the noah equivalent at the time actually sent out mailers like the one that I have here, basically saying that it was our duty as Americans to eat oysters. Why they, the whole mailer has why you should eat oysters. The oyster population in the US is the greatest in the world. It's, uh, they're, you're making these areas that are unproductive, just flat bottom. You're turning them into productive areas by adding oysters. And that, there's also this green gilled oyster, which is now coming back into fashion in North Carolina, but basically praising our oysters for being so great and so abundant. It, it's something that was good for our diets. Uh, it was also fun to eat them, just like that Hemingway quote. But what I particularly love about this mailer is that there's actually a place that you could write in for a, note, uh, a recipe book to learn ways to eat oysters. Now. There are a few things that we know about this as being wrong. As time went by, maybe oysters were not in such good shape after all. In 1882, the Maryland Oyster Commission actually started to realize that maybe we were eating too many oysters. Owing to the great extent of oyster beds in the bay, it may be some years before there is an oyster famine, but sooner or later it's coming, unless there's radical change in some of our present phases of our business. They knew that the way we were working with oysters, thinking about oysters, eating so many oysters as if they were uh, an unlimited supply, was not going to be sustainable. It, in fact, uh, it isn't. <laughs> when, back in history, when they were describing these as these navigational hazards, these underwater mounds and mountains, uh, now they're functionally extinct. 
What I have here is time and the number of oyster landings, the number of oysters brought to shore. And you can see this drastic decline. In fact, there's less than 1% of oysters worldwide remain in some of the major areas. So not only are we losing these oysters because we're eating the oyster themselves, but oysters are unique in that they also form habitat because they build these big reefs. And in that habitat forming function too, we now lose the oyster and the oyster reef, meaning that we lose these other benefits that oysters provide us. So where did all the oysters go? It's a combination of things. Uh, development in the watershed or in our coastal zones have basically uh, crushed that area that oysters need. The oysters are typically, you know, shallow subtidal or intertidal, and we just keep building and building and building. So we, in a lot of our coastal cities like Miami, uh, we don't have that space anymore where oysters can live. We also have uh, water quality problems in part because of increased development. Uh, we have that loss of all this nutrients or entering systems causing eutrophication or turning the water guacamole color green, as you can see in this photo. And at the same time, we've also had changes to, or we've also had over harvesting. So uh, historically, we've used destructive harvesting practices where we kind of go in and just pull out all the oyster reefs. And that's just also lost that habitat. So collectively, we've changed our environment and we have poorly managed the oysters, leading to uh, difficulty in restoring oysters, but also difficulty in maintaining oysters. Before we go much more into talking about oysters and the work that I do with them, we have to take a step back and talk a little bit about oysters. What are they? Oysters are filter feeding bivalve mollusks, meaning that they have two shells and a soft body. Uh, whenever they're underwater, they're pretty much filtering. So they're pulling material out from the water, like sediments, algae, anything, and uh, using some of that for their food, like algae, but then they repackage anything that's passed through, including sediments, into their biodeposits, which is collectively the species and pseudofeces. So uh, material that has been ingested, ingested and material that hasn't. Uh, which is why they're so charismatic. They're such good filterers. But the oyster life history of what makes them so cool. When we have these adult oysters, they spawn, releasing eggs into the water column. Eventually that egg is fertilized and you, the baby oyster goes through a series of different stages where it even gets a little foot here and then to help them swim, and then they settle. When they settle, they typically settle on other oysters because of some chemical cues, some sound cues, and uh, some hydrodynamics, changes in water flow that that reef would have. But once they settle, they stick like glue. So they are not moving ever again. So you better like your neighbor if you're an oyster. And that is why we can build these huge and huge reefs. As more and more oysters, Baby oysters settle on these adult oysters and then they just grow and grow and grow. So that loss of oysters, both of that filtration capacity and of that reef formation now comes with these consequences for the environment, including this, so the loss of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are benefits that we get from nature, that humans get from nature. And oysters provide a lot. Uh, in a study that my colleagues and I did a few years ago now, we actually quantified the dollar value that oysters provide uh, us in terms of ecosystem services. And it was about $10,000 per hectare annually. These services or the benefits that we're getting from oysters include the fishery, so having the oysters there that we can eat. Also then that habitat, that reef structure, so that can help other commercially available fish. The reef also has protection for shoreline. So as climate change, as sea level rise, we are starting to see more and more oyster reefs as living shorelines to help stabilize that shoreline. Uh, and then through their filtration capacity, they get water quality benefits, both from clearing the water uh, for water clarity, and then they also can help remove pollutants, including nutrients. 
And that's really where my passion for oysters comes from, is looking at their benefits that they give us, especially in the context of improving water quality. So this is a, many of you who have thought about bivalves have probably seen images like this, where the one tank doesn't have any oysters and the other tank does. Because they're suspension feeders, they can remove organic and inorganic particles that help to clear that water. So after a set period of time, when you would come back to your tanks, you end up seeing a tank with the oysters in it that is much clearer. You can now see through that water than you do on the other side where there are no oysters. It's estimated that an oyster, one oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day. So losing those oysters has real importance for water quality. In 1880, there were so many oysters in Chesapeake Bay that they could filter the entire volume of the bay in just 3.6 days. Fast forward to 2003, and now there, it takes the oysters 700 days to filter that same volume. Now, like I've just said, there's been a lot that's happened in Chesapeake Bay and in that watershed over that period of time. For example, there are many more people. There's a lot worse water quality. And there's also uh, diseases that are now affecting our oysters, which uh, affect, impact their ability to live and to thrive. So as oysters have declined in numbers, there's also been this change in the water quality really, where we now see a lot more sediments, a lot more pollution. So this makes the cycle kind of difficult to reverse, where the oysters can help improve water quality, because they can filter it, but they also need good water quality for oysters to survive. So we're kind of, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult cycle to really reverse. Uh, but filtration and water clarity are not the only issues that we've seen in coastal communities and away and uh, issues that oysters can play in. So I have here a few photos of algae or eutrophication. Eutrophication is the increase in organic matter in a system. Typically, when we see coastal water bodies and they're turned that guacamole colored green, uh, they are experiencing symptoms of eutrophication. So this eutrophication can look like a lot of different things. We have that algae blooms in both the Potomac River and in the Caloosahatchee Bay photos here. We also have kills that are associated with eutrophication. Uh, and then in Florida Bay, we have macroalgae uh, taking over seagrass beds. So these are all sort of images of eutrophication. Eutrophication is really characterized by these algal blooms. And then these fish kills, where these low oxygen events happen as the algae die and decompose, and that process sucks out oxygen. Uh, and then fish can get trapped in that low oxygen zone and end up not being able to breathe, basically suffocating. That also affects oysters because if they're in these low oxygen zones, they're not getting any oysters. I mean, any oxygen, sorry. And then it also can affect seagrass, uh, where eutrophication causing these algal blooms can then decrease light availability to the benthos, to the seagrasses. So eutrophication is a global problem and 65% of estuaries in the United States are actually characterized as eutrophic uh, and experiencing symptoms of eutrophication usually linked to excess nutrients. So eutrophication brought about by too many nutrients, particularly nitrogen. Now, Nitrogen in excess is considered a pollutant. But if you're like me, that's a little bit hard to think of nitrogen as a pollutant because we need nitrogen. It's the base of our food web. So I think of nitrogen like I think of coffee. I need coffee to start my day. But if I have too much coffee, my system is gonna go into overdrive and I'm gonna crash eventually. And it's gonna take me a little bit of time to recover from that. That's how nutrients are for coastal systems, nitrogen in particular, where would they need nitrogen? It's the base of this food web. So there's a, a good balance where nitrogen can enter the system, feed some algae, but there's still light getting to the bottom and there's still oxygen getting to the bottom. 
But when we have too much nutrients, too many nutrients, then we have that eutrophic conditions establish. And then we have all those symptoms that we talked about, the algal bloom, the loss of benthic habitats, the fish kills. So those are all consequences of too much nitrogen. It's having too much nitrogen then that makes that water you, that you don't wanna fish in, that you don't wanna swim in, that's leading to a deterioration in water quality. So nitrogen is now considered a pollutant, a big pollutant. And many governments in coastal waterways are looking for ways to manage nitrogen. In fact, the Chesapeake Bay has been put on a nitrogen diet. That's what I've plotted here. The amount of nitrogen that they need to have reduced from entering the bay over time. And you can see this drastic decline between 1985 and 2015 target they're looking for. So the goal is to reduce uh, nitrogen in, in that system by 25% by the year 2025. So think about that if you were trying to uh, go on a diet yourself. Like if you weigh 150 pounds, that means you're gonna try to lose 37.5 pounds. So what would you be doing? You would probably be doing everything in your power to meet that diet, that demand. Uh, and that's what our governments are doing too. They're trying to find ways to remove nitrogen. Uh, reducing nitrogen is not just something that an individual can do though. It really takes solutions that could be controversial at times, but they can affect individuals, society, and they also take political will, like having this government mandated diet. Some common ways to treat nu nutrient pollution are through engineering solutions, where we have wastewater treatment plants to process the nitrogen before it enters the estuaries, and stormwater ponds, you probably see these around your communities, to treat that runoff, uh, to process it so nitrogen doesn't go into the coastal zones. But there is a natural way to remove nitrogen. It's called denitrification. Denitrification is a microbially mediated process that converts nitrogen that's in the form of fertilizer or the form that is harmful, causing eutrophication into harmless nitrogen gas. Denitrification is considered a loss of nitrogen from the ecosystem. It's a net removal. There are three things that have to occur for denitrification to happen. You have to have nitrates, so that's that bioavailable or the uh, harmful form of nitrogen uh, that's caused that eutrophication. Carbs, and they have to have uh, low oxygen conditions. That's because denitrification is basically like respiration, uh, but using nitrate instead of oxygen. And the bacteria who perform this reaction uh, would rather use oxygen to break down carbon when it's available. Because they're facultative anaerobic bacteria. So they can switch between low ox using oxygen, not using oxygen, depending on conditions. But when you have these areas then where you have nitrate, you have a carbon source, and you can have low oxygen conditions, then you can have denitrification. So this is where oysters come into play. Uh, oysters are actually able to remove nitrogen, which can help provide these water quality benefits. To, if we think about this, we have the nitrogen that enters our system that's fed the algae, then as that's filtered, uh, repackaged to the benthos as these biodeposits, which is juicy organic matter for the microbes. And then through a series of reactions uh, that can be converted into N2 gas, denitrification happens. We want nitrogen to be an N2, as N2 gas. The majority of our atmosphere, 78%, is N2 gas. So this process facilitated by the oysters demonstrates how the nitrogen that entered the system that fed the algae or led to the algae growth that's been grazed by the oysters is now converted into N2 gas, representing a removal of that nitrogen. So it's this benthic pelagic coupling moving from the water column to the benthos that uh, are really why oysters can help to create these conditions for nitrogen removal. This has led a lot of us to think and ask, is nitro are oysters a solution to our pollution problems? 
We've seen these reports everywhere. Could oysters be used to clean up the bay? How mussel farming could help to clean fouled waters? In fact, they're considered, nitrogen filtering oysters are considered the sunken treasure for meeting the water quality challenge that Chesapeake Bay has. This is really what my work has focused on, is seeing if oysters are the solution to pollution and how much they, how effective they are at doing this. So for my dissertation work, I've really focused on restoring oysters uh, and oyster reefs to enhance denitrification. And my work demonstrates that when you have oysters there, you have more nitrogen removal or denitrification. What I've plotted here is just sediment control reference, no oysters on it. And then our other bar is our, our restored oyster reefs. And you can see that there is significantly more denitrification or that N2 gas production with oysters there than without. Meaning that having more oysters would remove nitrogen and help and could help combat eutrophication. Overall, we found that the, that increase in denitrification due to oysters was about 23 kilograms of nitrogen per acre annually. And that can then have a value because there's services of nitrogen removal. If you wanted to get that same amount of nitrogen removal through a wastewater treatment plant, for example, you, it would cost anywhere between $176 and $267. Uh, so this is a value then that having oyster reefs in our, oysters and oyster reefs in our environment can provide us. Some, some states like Maryland and Virginia and North Carolina will actually trade nutrient credits. So in theory, you could trade oysters like you trade carbon credits for their water quality benefits. So are oyster reefs the solution to pollution? Well, oyster reefs are hot spots for nitrogen removal. Uh, and if they wanna use those, if we wanna use oysters to meet the goals of Chesapeake Bay, we would need about 600,000 hectares of oyster reefs. That's a lot of oysters. And that's expensive. Restoring oysters can cost anywhere between $52,000 and $260,000 per hectare. There is, however, a way to increase oysters in our environment, but in an economic framework, and that's through aquaculture. Aquaculture is growing in the United States and around the world, and shellfish offer a really good way uh, for aquaculture because you're putting oysters, these shellfish, these filter feeding shellfish back into the environment, but in an economic framework. So I have here uh, an oyster cage aquaculture setting and an oyster reef. And you can see that they're pretty different, right? Like the reef has all this structure, kind of an unknown number of oysters. Um, oyster aquaculture is a really highly controlled and managed area. So they know the number of oysters that are there. They're really controlling for predation by having these cages, uh, but they're still oysters. So the oysters that are grown in aquaculture function pretty much the same as oysters that are grown in the wild. And, but this was, uh, so this was really, my question then was for denitrification capacity. If we know that they're both gonna be filter feeding, do we still see that same increase in nitrogen gas production or denitrification? So what my student is currently working on is this comparison, looking at oyster aquaculture and oyster reefs. So what I've plotted for you here is again, that denitrification and your reference is that control sediments or that uh, no oysters present. And we have our aquaculture site, and then we also have our reef site. And you can see that in each instance, whether it's aquaculture or a reef, we see an increase in denitrification when oysters are there. And that this increase is actually similar between aquaculture or reefs. So there's a lot of, like, a lot of studies around the world are really focusing on oysters and seeing if this difference in denitrification uh, how that varies between locations. Uh, most of our work on this has been coming from North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Maryland, and up in New England. I live in Florida, so I think a lot about Florida, and I know we have some Emory people with us today too, and there's not much in the Georgia coast or even in the Panhandle or down in Florida about oysters and their ability to remove nitrogen. And there are plenty of estuaries and coastal areas that are experiencing symptoms of eutrophication there. And it's not 
fair to think that they might all be the same because there's differences in the phytoplankton community. There's differences in water quality, like salinity changes, amount of like particles in the water. So we might not be able to see all the denitrification up for every oyster. What about other shellfish? Oysters are not the same, are not the only filter feeding bivalve. We also have mussels and clams and scallops. Some of my work suggests that uh, clams will increase denitrification, mussels can increase denitrification, but the magnitude of this is much greater with oysters than these other uh, shellfish. But stay tuned, more work is needed to figure out how aquaculture of that, of those other species might affect that. And if we are some way that we can actually manage our systems, our aquaculture systems, for increased denitrification. All of this is to say that oysters are just part of our solution to our water quality problems. Uh, they are a win-win in that they provide both an economic benefit through aquaculture, and they also provide environmental benefits through their water quality services and that nitrogen removal. Uh, and that's the reason that everybody should be eating oysters, especially aquacultured oysters. Uh, but they're not going to be the silver bullet or the only way to really solve our water quality problems. To do that, we have to go to the source and think about what we're doing on land and how that can impact water quality downstream. So I hope that for all of you, the next time you go to an oyster bar and you see some oysters, you think not only how great that's going to taste for you, and the pleasure you'll get from eating it, but the benefits that that oyster has provided the environment while being out there filtering the water for us. So thank you for your attention and I'll take questions after our next speaker. All right, thank you, Dr. Smith. That was really an engaging uh, presentation. Um, so now uh, Dr. Laney will speak. I will just uh, reintroduce him very quickly. Uh, he completed uh, his studies at North Carolina, receiving his PhD at North Carolina State University in Zoology. Um, and he has served on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for almost 38 years. His passion and dedication to his work has earned him the NC Conservation of the Year Award in 2019. Today, Dr. Lane will be focusing on his presentation on wild fish stocks and sustainability sustainable fishery management. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Laney. Okay, can you all hear me now? Thank yes, we can. Hello. Yes, we can. Okay, great, great. Okay, thanks. Well, I apologize to everyone profusely. Uh, fortunately, uh, Brian and Alyssa and Jaya and, and Ashley and I had all prepared a backup plan in case somebody's internet went out and ours, in fact, did go out. It, it, somebody must have cut a cable somewhere because it's out over the whole uh, community. So. Um, Brian has my presentation pulled up, hopefully. Are you on the first slide there? I'm on your intro slide. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, I, I'll just say, uh, I'll just insert a click, Brian, anytime I want you to, uh, to switch slides. Sounds so good. So we, we can go ahead, go ahead to uh, click to the second one. So basically what uh, the team asked me to talk about today was uh, sustainable seafood and, and client, uh, climate change and the connections thereof. And, and uh, Ashley, I knew, was going to focus on oysters and aquaculture. Uh, so I'm going to talk about mostly wild stocks, and I'm going to talk to you about the principles for sustainable seafood the species of commercial and recreational importance that are common on the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico, a little bit about wild stock sustainability management, uh, connections to a changing climate, and species and habitat vulnerability. So click away, Brian. We should be on slide three. So I pulled up 
some principles for sustainability because I think many of you may be wondering, well, what does it take to make a seafood sustainable? And the Marine Stewardship Council on their website had three very nice principles that I think apply to pretty much any type of seafood organism, whether it be oysters or lobsters or fish. So the first thing is, in order for a stock to be sustainable, you have to control fishing at a level that ensures that the fish population can continue indefinitely and can may remain productive and sustainable and healthy. The second thing is that when you are fishing, you need to minimize the environmental impact because if you don't take care of the habitat, other species and habitats within the ecosystem could be adversely impacted. And you want your habitat to stay healthy. So for example, if you're using a mobile gear, a movable gear, uh, and you are targeting a species that occupies a, a submerged aquatic vegetation bed or a uh, coral reef, for example, and you drag gear through it, you may destroy the habitat and totally wipe out the habitat that a particular fishery needs. Uh, one, for example, that uh, I won't talk about other than just to mention it, because it is so tied to seagrass beds, is base scallops, for example. And then finally, the third principle of uh, stewardship for sustainable fisheries is that you have to effectively manage the fishery. If a uh, fishery is well managed, it will comply with the relevant laws and it will be able to adapt to changing environmental circumstances. So we can go to slide four, Brian. So what species are under management on the East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. I have a few listed here and to the right, we have a few pictures of some of these. Uh, the first category is highly migratory species. These are species that live mostly out in the open ocean. They are, uh, for the most part, large, fast swimming. They uh, spend a lot of time uh, moving from one place to another. Those are species like billfishes, and the one that's pictured there is a blue marlin, which is a very large, uh, charismatic megafauna, we would say, a, a fish that is uh, highly sought after by charter fishermen in particular, but also commercially fished with long lines. Uh, second category are coastal migratory pelagic species. These are also more open ocean, but tend to be closer to shore. And the second one pictured there is a dolphin fish, uh, also known as mahi-mahi, which is the Hawaiian name, a very popular fish and very much consumed in restaurants. Um, Another category are nearshore and estuarine dependent species. So these are like coastal sharks, uh, corals, golden crab, shrimp. Uh, the pinead ones are the ones that we all eat, the pink, brown, and white shrimp. Uh, snappers and groupers, even sargassum weed and spiny lobsters. Another category, and this is kind of a biological category, are the drums which include Atlantic croaker, black drum, red drum, spot, spotted sea trout, and wheat fish. And I, I have over to the right there, the third fish from the top is a red drum, also known as red fish, which happens to be the state fish of North Carolina, which also happens to hold the world record for red drum uh, caught in the surf on the Outer Banks. Then we have decapod crustaceans which are brown, pink, and white shrimps, blue crabs, golden crabs, and spiny lobsters, and American lobster, the one with the big claws over to the bottom right. And finally, uh, the group of species that I have specialized in for most of my career are the diadromous species. And diadromous is just a big word. It basically means they require two different types of habitat. Uh, for the ones that are anadromous, they spend most of their lives in the ocean, but they swim up freshwater rivers to spawn. Those are like the alewife, American shad, Atlantic sturgeon, blueback herring, hickory shad, uh, sea lamprey, short-nosed sturgeon, and striped bass. And then the one that does the reverse of that, the catadromous species, 
is the American eel, which grows up, spends most of its life in freshwater, and then goes back to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to the Sargasso Sea to spawn. And here are, uh, in slide five, uh, pictures of all of these anadromous and catadromous species, collectively known as diadromous species, which is what it says up at the top. And these are the ones that occur in the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, most of these are already named, I think. Uh, over on the left-hand side are the two sturgeon species that we have, Atlantic sturgeon and short-nosed sturgeon on the Atlantic. And then there is one that looks just like the Atlantic sturgeon in the Gulf of Mexico called the Gulf sturgeon. So moving on to slide six. So who manages all these species for sustainability? Well, there's a whole host of institutions that manage them. And we're not going to talk about them except in general terms today, but in general, the more migratory a species is, the more regional or international management it will have. So those highly migratory species, the tunas, the billfishes, are, are under the management of those top two institutions there. For the tunas, it's the uh, International Council for Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or ICAT for short, and the National Marine Fishery Service, which is responsible for managing the highly migratory species. NIMFS, as we call it, NMFS, is also a member of federal fishery management councils and interstate fishery management commissions. Uh, like the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is the logo on the top at the right there. The Fish and Wildlife Service is also a mandated member of the councils and the commissions, mandated by Congress under a couple of different pieces of federal legislation, those being the Atlantic Coastal Fisheries Cooperative Management Act and the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation Act. And we have eight federal fishery management councils uh, in the United States that are all responsible for regional management of a bunch of different species. And the ones that we have on the East Coast are the New England, Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. So five of the eight are on the East Coast. And we have three interstate fisheries management commissions. The one on the East Coast is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and it has, it's the only one that has a congressionally mandated act that dictates how it can do business. And that's the Atlantic Coastal Fisheries Cooperative Management Act. The states and the territories are the entities that actually do the management. So the councils and the commissions develop the management plans. And then the states and the territories are responsible for stepping those down to their jurisdictional area and carrying out the mandates of those plans. Below that are local governments and communities. And you may say, well, why are local governments and communities involved in management? The reasons are twofold. In some cases, for example, in New England, some of the anadromous species, the river herrings, the alewives, and the blueback herring, are actually managed by the local communities. Uh, there'll be a stream where these fishes uh, swim in to spawn in the spring of the year. And in many cases, the communities have provided access to uh, lakes in the case of alewives, to stream systems in the case of blueback herring. They are very well organized. They have fish ladders, they have volunteers out there that do fish counts, and they actually get a count of the entire spawning run every year. So there's, it's very much what we call community-based management. But the other way local governments and communities are engaged in management is by influencing what happens to the habitat. Ashley talked to you about why there's been such a tremendous decline in the oyster population, a lot of it having to do with development in the watershed, with adverse impacts to water quality uh, and adverse impacts to the habitats that are on the bottom of the water bodies. And a lot of that has to do with how local governments 
develop or don't develop the riparian habitats, those that are immediately adjacent to the waterways. Uh, so the more uh, sustainable and responsible your local land use management is, your local zoning, the more uh, you are likely to have good quality habitat. So local governments and communities play a great role in that. And finally, you as an individual, if you like to fish, uh, are part of the management process too, because if you don't abide by the regulations, then you're not helping to be a sustainable, you're not helping the fishery to be sustainable. Uh, you have to abide by the bag limits and the size limits. Those are put there for a reason to help keep the fishery be sustainable. And as long as you abide by those, you're, you're part of the process of keeping that population sustainable. Okay, Brian, we can go to seven. So what's climate change going to do to all of this? Well, there have been quite a few folks that have looked at this for many, many decades now. Um, there are some references up to the up at the top of the page there that we can talk about later or you can look at for uh, detailed information. But basically, there's a whole laundry list of things that are likely to happen under a changing climate. The water and air temperatures are probably going to go up. And the reason that's important is because species use temperature changes in some cases as cues for when they should spawn, but also a lot of their life stages have tolerance limits that are cued to temperature. They have optimum ranges of temperature within which their growth is uh, optimal, and if they are taken outside of that temperature range, then they may get into trouble. Their growth may not be optimal, um, and there will be other impacts, and we'll talk about those in a minute. There are likely to be increased areas of low dissolved oxygen. That's because as the water temperature goes up, the amount of oxygen it can hold declines. And so what you wind up with is degraded nursery habitat in estuaries and generally in the ocean as well. Um, if you are at all familiar with Chesapeake Bay or Florida Bay in Florida, uh, Indian River Lagoon, the Noose River Estuary in North Carolina, these are all areas where summer temperatures tend to be very warm anyway. And if there have been uh, nutrient inputs uh, to which Ashley referred that cause eutrophication, then the oxygen level is likely to go down. And if you can't breathe, you're in trouble. Another change will be uh, the amount of rainfall and consequently the amount of river discharge. Uh, there have been all sorts of climate change models that have been done. Uh, those can be stepped down to regional levels and we can look at what is projected to happen with the rainfall and river discharge. <clears throat> and the reason that is particularly important for these diadromous fishes is they are dependent on flow cues as another spawning uh, tip off along with water temperature. So if, if the flow characteristics, what we call the hydrograph of a river, changes dramatically, then the fish may or may not recognize that it's time to swim upstream. Another factor is the increased frequency of severe tropical storms. I think this year has been a great example of, of that. I mean, we had, what, more named storms this year than in any other year in history, I think, and storms later into the year. Um, in North Carolina and South Carolina in particular, and I suspect in Florida too, although I didn't pull any examples from Florida, when you have these severe storms that in many cases now are very slow moving and produce tremendous amounts of rainfall, you have consequent flooding, low dissolved oxygen, and then catastrophic juvenile and adult mortality. Again, if the oxygen levels go to zero for a week or even longer, you can't breathe. If you can't swim away from it, you're gonna die. Another one is changes in the pH or the acidity of the ocean. The more carbon dioxide we put out into the atmosphere, uh, 
The more of that is absorbed into the ocean, the lower the pH. And if you're an organism that builds a calcium carbonate shell, like an oyster, or like many of the other bivalves, it could create problems for you if you can't properly metabolize the uh, minerals that you need to form your shell. And finally, there could be changes in ocean circulation. And that's important because a lot of these marine animals especially uh, depend on currents for transportation in their larval stages. So if something changes in the Gulf Stream, for example, that could affect uh, larval and juvenile American eels uh, getting from their spawning area in the Sargasso Sea to the streams and rivers that they reside in, in the Caribbean islands, but also along the Caribbean, uh, along the East Coast. So Brian, go to number eight. So what are the responses to all these changes? Well, they could be any of these following. Uh, distribution shifts. Uh, if it gets hotter than you like, you go further north where it's cooler, or you go offshore to a deeper area where it's cooler. So you search for your optimum temperature regime. There could be changes in timing and possibly location of spawning. If your river discharge is changing and your temperature is changing so that it reaches the appropriate temperature for you to spawn earlier in the year, and then it gets too hot, uh, sooner than it used to, then that tends to shorten your spawning window on both ends. And one of our grad students at NC State, Steve Lombardo, who's now in Florida, working on his PhD on bonefish, did a very excellent study on river herring here in North Carolina that showed exactly that change in spawning window uh, that has occurred over a 50 year period. There's a longer growing season in some cases. If the temperature's increasing, uh, that could be uh, an advantage for some species. It might make the growing season longer in an area that is presently on the cool side, which may have a shorter growing season. It could be longer if the temperature is warmer in general during the winter time. Uh, there could be increased energetic demand. If you're living, you're a fish or you're an invertebrate and you're living at a uh, higher temperature, it's gonna take more calories, more nutrition for you to meet your energy demand, uh, but also you may have a reduced size due to a lower dissolved oxygen content because you can't get enough air. You could have increased susceptibility to disease because some diseases do better if the water temperature is warmer. And finally, you could have an increased susceptibility to death as a result of storm-related oxygen deprivation. So some illustrations for some of these things. This one is one that I found online. It, it really doesn't have to do with uh, marine organisms, but it's a couple of alligators with their bags packed. And uh, the caption up at the top says, animals and plants fleeing climate change are migrating toward the poles at 20 centimeters per hour. Now that doesn't sound like too much. 20 centimeters is a little bit less than 10 inches, but still, it, it gets the point across. The youngster there is asking, Dad, when will we get to Canada? And Dad is saying, or Mom, whichever that is, it's hard to tell alligators apart just looking at them. Uh, it says, this is Canada, which is kind of funny because there's palm trees and flamingos there. The second image I want to show to you is an image of American eels. This was taken during one of our hurricanes here in North Carolina about two years ago. This is on the, the lower Cape Fear River in southeastern North Carolina. The uh, flooding was severe. The oxygen level went to zero for several weeks. And these are American eels trying to get out of the water so they can breathe uh, as a result of that storm. Uh, American eels are typically thought of as fairly hardy uh, species that are pretty tolerant of low uh, oxygen and uh, degraded water quality conditions, but you can see here that it had a significant impact on them, and most of these animals subsequently died. To illustrate uh, this point about fish having to gasp for air in warmer waters and shrinking in size, here's a nice illustration from 
a paper by Polly and Chung in 2017 that illustrates the point. Fish, of course, have to breathe using their gills, which work like a sieve and extract oxygen from the water. Uh, and if they can't get enough oxygen to provide for optimal growth, then that leads to a 20 to 30 percent decrease in body size, uh, just as a general principle. Another uh, illustration here, uh, and this one, uh, I didn't catch the paper it came from, but this is what happens to our fish if we get a two degree centigrade increase by 2050. We will get a lower global fish catch, and those numbers in red there are the losses that we would experience. So uh, right now, we uh, are projecting a $17 billion loss from what has happened already. It could go up to a $40 billion per year loss. Fish are getting smaller, they say. They've already lost 14% in some cases. They're gonna be 24% smaller by 2050. And different fish occur in different temperature regimes, as I noted already. So the dominant fish in the Sea of Japan used to be sardines, now it's anchovies. So these are the kind of changes we're seeing. So one of the things that we're trying to do to help us understand what's going on and to begin planning for uh, management is to assess the vulnerability of individual species and their habitats. So Dr. John Hare, who's at the National Marine Fishery Service Northeast Fishery Science Center now, and his co-authors in 2016 conducted a vulnerability assessment of fish and invertebrates uh, to climate change, uh, looking at the Northeast U.S. continental shelf. And a team uh, on which I and several of my colleagues are serving is doing the same sort of analysis for the South Atlantic now um, it's in progress. Hopefully, we'll have it wrapped up by the end of the year. NIPS is also doing a climate vulnerability assessment for habitats, and that work is going on in the Northeast. We haven't even started it in the Southeast yet, but we hope to do one in the Southeast as well. So how do we do this? Well, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I am going to show you the list of the sorts of things we think about when we're looking at an individual species. These are the biological sensitivity factors that go into this assessment process. So I'll just pick a couple of them to talk about here. First one is prey specificity. So if you are an animal that eats a particular prey and nothing else, only that one prey animal, then you are much more vulnerable to uh, climate change. If a warming temperature, for example, affects your prey and you are not very adept at switching to another prey, that's going to increase your vulnerability. Same thing with the second one there, habitat specificity. I mentioned um, base scallops earlier. Base scallops are very tightly tied to submerged aquatic vegetation beds. Uh, along the East Coast and along the Florida Gulf Coast. If the temperature gets so high that turtle grass, for example, or eelgrass on the East Coast disappears, the bay scallops habitat is gone. Uh, bay scallops subsequently disappear. Uh, skipping on down to, uh, let's see, let's look at another one here. Complexity and reproductive strategy, number four there. If you are a diadema species that has an extremely complicated life cycle. You live most of the time in the ocean. You go into freshwater rivers to spawn. You lay an egg. The egg hatches into a larva. The larva turns into a post larva. The post larva lives in the river for a while, then in the estuary for a while, then goes back to the ocean, uh, lives out there for three to five to 10 years before it matures, and then has to go back to the river again. The more complex your reproductive strategy is, the more vulnerable you are. The same sort of thing uh, is the case for the third one up from the bottom there, dispersal of early life stages. If you are an organism uh, like American eels that spawns in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in the Sargasso Sea, and then your early life stages, your eggs, 
your leptocephalus larvae, which is what the egg hatches out to be, and then your glacial stage, if all those are dispersed widely, then you are less susceptible to uh, climate change impacts than if your larval stages are dispersed and stay in one particular place. The same thing happens with adult mobility. If a species is highly mobile, then it's much more likely to be able to find a preferred temperature uh, than it is if it is a sessile species like an oyster. Oysters can't move around very much once they reach sexual maturity. So they're kind of stuck where they are. So high temperatures can really do them in, or low oxygen, either one. So we take each species, we have 70 some species in the South Atlantic. Uh, they took 82 different species in the Northeast through this uh, process. And here's what comes out of it. In uh, slide 15, you wind up with a matrix like this that basically shows you which species are projected to be less vulnerable and which are the most vulnerable. And obviously, if you're green and in the lower left hand, uh, part of the graph, you're in pretty good shape. If you're bright red and you're in the upper uh, right-hand corner, you're not in such good shape. And if you'll notice, the second box, the second red box in the right-hand column there, most of those diadema species that we talked about are in that box. American shad, blueback herring, hickory shad, short-nosed sturgeon, alewife, Atlantic sturgeon, those are all anadromous species that have those complicated life cycles. Um, for the habitat assessment, we can go to slide 16, and you see that they're using a similar methodology for habitat uh, assessments. I'm not going to talk about this one. I'm not as familiar with this one. They are working on one for the Northeast. Uh, they are supposed to have it done, I think, maybe by the end of this year, but you can see on the right-hand side of the slide there uh, is a similar list of sensitivity and adaptive ca capacity attributes for habitats. Uh, and they can take each habitat through this whole series of uh, metrics and come out with a likelihood of how vulnerable they are. Okay, moving to slide 17, some fish and fisheries that are already moving. These are, are species that we already know have been affected by climate change. Uh, black sea bass, bass north of Cape Hatteras are moving north. Uh, northern shrimp, which is the second from the left species there, the pink one, has been impacted by rising temperature. It affects its larval stages. So uh, recruitment has really bottomed out and that fishery basically has collapsed in the southern part of its range. Striped bass, uh, the migratory ones that uh, live in the ocean, and these are fish that come from the Roanoke River Albemarle Sound system in North Carolina up through the Kennebec River system in Maine. Uh, after they're over age uh, three to six, they spend most of their life offshore. Traditionally, they wintered off the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Now they have shifted their range further north and they're way out in the exclusive economic zone, 25 to 30 miles offshore in, uh, uh, off of Virginia. But they also stay off of Maryland and New Jersey, again, because winters are getting warmer. They don't need to come as far south to find uh, uh, their preferred temperature. And the last species here is white shrimp, which is also shifting to the north, so much so that Chesapeake Bay is now producing white shrimp and there is a, a white shrimp fishery off Virginia that is kind of an experimental one. Uh, fishery allocations, as far as a human impact goes, when these fish shift their distribution, then all of a sudden, the commercial fishermen who had an allocation for that species no longer are able to catch the species. North Carolina, for example, had allocations for gillnet, hall seine, and trawl fishery sectors which haven't been landed now since 2011. And here's why you can look at the striped bass distribution on slide 18 and see where those black lines are in each one of these panels looking from the top left, which is 1988, to the bottom right, which is 2013. You can see the black lines are the center of distribution based on our wintertime tagging uh, survey 
And you'll note that in 2013, that black line has shifted up off the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. And I can tell you that since 2013, the, the next seven years all have been the same thing. Uh, it started to sort of happen in 2007. If you look at that frame, uh, 2006, still hanging around the North Carolina and Virginia line. Same thing in 2009 and 2010. Uh, I haven't looked at the temperatures. That might have been a colder winter, and they were back down off the Outer Banks again. But then in 2013, they're back up off Virginia. Uh, and if you want further information on these changes, here are some references in uh, slide 19 that you can uh, check out for additional information. So going to slide 20, what's next? Well, what's next, I think, is best summarized uh, by one of the papers from uh, Jane Lubchenco and Stephen Gaines in 2019. Uh, they basically said, we need a new narrative for the ocean. For most of human history, they pointed out, people considered the ocean so immense, bountiful, and resilient that it was impossible to deplete or disrupt it. And now, reforming fisheries to fish smarter, not harder, can help restore ocean ecosystems, reduce impacts of climate change, and enhance food security, job creation, and poverty alleviation. And I would certainly agree with that. They closed by saying it is time for a new ocean narrative that says the ocean is so central to our future, it's too important to neglect. And you can flip to the last slide there, Brian, that's slide 21. And I'll be happy to take any questions as along with Ashley. And this photo is one that shows us during the winter time off of North Carolina or Virginia tagging striped bass, which we've been doing since 1988. So uh, with that, I will stop talking and uh, wait and see if we get any questions. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Awesome. Thank you both for your engaging and informative presentations. Everyone can turn on their video cameras if you'd like. We'll be moving on to a Q&A session. We'll be uh, asking questions that were posted in the chat during the presentation. Uh, but feel free to continue posting questions in the chat during this time. Um, I have a question that I was working the video, so I didn't get a chance to type it in. For, it could be for um, uh, Dr. Laney or Dr. Smith. With, I mean, climate change is such a big topic, and how the you know the the effects on different fisher, you know, fisheries is is you know, just depends. It's it's so broad. We get asked a lot, especially with the uh, ocean acidification, the pH changes. Are some of the macro invertebrates, like your oysters, mm -hmm. clams, are, are are we feeling? Are they getting eff feeling effects from any ocean acidification in the southeast U.S. anyway? I think that's an Ashley question. <laughs> uh, so most of our, the Pacific Northeast or Pacific Northeast, there's studies that show the pH is changing uh, the thickness of the shells, so making them more vulnerable to predation. It's also affecting the, their reproduction. Uh, in the southeast, we are not really seeing as big of a pH ocean acidification issues for our shellfish. Uh, our waterways or these estuaries have big tides daily, so they see large fluctuations in pH on a regular basis that like the west coast doesn't see. So in some ways, we are, our shellfish are a little bit more prepared for those pH changes, uh, but it's, uh, it's probably coming. You can, if you have any other questions, Alyssa and Jaya, you can direct them toward whoever and I'll turn okay. the mic off. Uh, Dr. Laney, a uh, question for you. To what extent does the shifting of these wild fish stocks impact the economies of the coastal communities? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Uh, it can be significant. Uh, for example, the, the example that I gave you uh, for striped bass uh, is an example where those individuals who held allocations for striped bass, in other words, they, they were uh, allotted a certain poundage of that species, 
for those three sectors that I mentioned for gillnets, hall sains, and trawls off of uh, North Carolina uh, don't get any income, don't derive any income anymore from, from those uh, species. Um, other, in other cases, for example, uh, north of Cape Hatteras where black sea bass are moving north, then a species that uh, wasn't present before all of a sudden is present or maybe gradually becomes present. So it, it's uh, an added a benefit for those communities. Um, there are studies going on of how climate changes uh, in uh, the marine and estuarine system are going to affect the socioeconomic sector. You know, those data are a lot more challenging together. Sometimes it's easier to get the biological data than it is to get the socioeconomic data, uh, in part due to, you know, the need for maintaining confidentiality. Uh, but it, it, the, the impacts can be very significant uh, in both directions. You know, there, there are going to be um, losers as a species uh, maybe drops out of the picture entirely, uh, or there will be winners as a species shows up uh, in a community where it wasn't present before. And I will say that North Carolina is uh, geographically is in an arena where you have two large marine ecosystems that come together. So North Carolina is at the southern end of the range for a lot of species. It's at the northern end of the range for other species. And so we're seeing species that are moving north, like snowy grouper, um, blue line tilefish, um, and then other species that um, um, may disappear uh, from North Carolina waters like those migratory striped bass uh, that are seeking their uh, optimal water temperature probably and and or optimal prey. Uh, I should have said when I was talking about that, the other thing that, that a species will shift its distribution as a consequence of is, is prey distribution. So uh, even if the, the temperature uh, may be suboptimal, sometimes a species will shift its distribution in response to prey distribution. So it's, it's fairly complicated, but the, but the answer is it can cut both ways. You know, you can, you can have a significant loss or you can have a significant gain, depending on how different species are responding differently to climate change. Thank you. Um, we had a question from the chat for Dr. Smith. Are there aquaculture farms in Tampa Bay? I'm smiling because just last month, they actually had one of the first aquaculture farms go live down there, uh, Lost Coast Aquaculture. Tampa Bay is one of those great success stories for how we have collectively worked to manage our uh, impacts on the environment. Uh, Tampa Bay had some serious nutrient pollution problems and really so on reducing nitrogen inputs and then also on restoration of seagrass beds. So those combined effects are uh, really put Tampa Bay at the forefront of like how we can actually help our environment. And the fact that they have oyster, like aquaculture there now just, just proves that. So. Awesome. Okay, uh, back to Dr. Laney. Um, are there any short-term solutions to address climate-related changes in order to mit mitigate the immediate effects? I can't think of any short-term solutions. Uh, most of the studies that I have read suggest that even if we ceased uh, emitting greenhouse gases today, that the temperature is still going to continue to climb for a while. Um, I think the best solution is for society to A, acknowledge that climate change exists. Uh, some people acknowledge that it exists, but still question whether or not it is human derived or not. Uh, I, I'm one of the folks that believes that we as humans are definitely a contributing factor to climate change. So I think it's going to take, you know, cultural change in the way we live our lives, um, generational change, hopefully, 
those of you in the younger generations will recognize the need for us to change our lifestyle, change the way that we live, and reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that we're emitting um, and keep things more stable. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there is any short-term solution to it, at least if there is, uh, I wish somebody would bring it to my attention. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add to that, Dr. Smith, about um, like any short-term solutions to address climate-related changes in order to mitigate more immediate effects? I think it's just like what, to echo what Dr. Laney just said. Uh, I think the we all have to be focusing on what we can do as individuals to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and those are like little things, you know, like uh, riding your bike to work or even things like not running water when you're brushing your teeth. Those little things can add up. And I think we just need to be conscious of that a little bit more. Uh, I also, you know, from like the grand benefits, we should be spending, restoring habitats that can sequester carbon too, uh, like mangroves and seagrass beds and uh, salt marshes. Like having those blue carbon habitats is valuable. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just chime in and say I agree with everything Ashley just said. And, you know, thinking back again to the way the question was phrased, in terms of short term, there are some things that you can do to adapt to or mitigate to a certain extent, you know, the changes that are occurring as a result of the changing climate. For example, if, if you're a, a fisherman, um, and you were dependent on a particular species like striped bass that disappears from your waters, then perhaps you can adapt and switch to some other species. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the sorts of carbon sequestration that Ashley referred to, <clears throat> you know, we know that we have rising sea level uh, is another consequence of climate change, which it occurs to me I didn't even put on that slide, and I needed to add that. Um, but what that that means is that uh, if our salt marsh uh, wetland habitats, for example, can't migrate across the landscape, then then that's going to result in the long-term loss of those habitats. But there are some things we can do to mitigate for those uh, habitats. We can acquire uh, conservation lands landward of salt marshes. We can remove impediments to the migration of those habitats, such as making sure that we have no uh, bulkheads, for example, that would preclude the marsh moving inland as sea level rises. So there are some, I, will, I, will, I won't say they're short term, it uh, depends on how you define short, but they are shorter term than the sorts of cultural changes that Ashley and I were talking about. Okay, uh, another question for Dr. Laney. Um, are there any evidence that the shifting distribution of the communities uh, will cause any widespread extinction events? That is a good question. I don't know that anyone has looked at that in particular. I, I don't know about widespread extinction events. You know, as Lubchenko and Gaines noted, for years and years and years, we thought, you know, the oceans are just inexhaustible, the species are so numerous that there's no way we can cause them to go extinct. Well, we, we've learned that that isn't the case. We certainly can. Um, fish species to economic extinction for sure. Biological extinction is uh, a more difficult proposition, but, and I'll see if Ashley would agree with me, I, I think if that does happen, the most likely place that could happen would be in coral reef ecosystems, which, uh, you know, extend in a, a sort of a belt uh, around the globe uh, in, in tropical climates, which are already at the upper end of uh, their preferred temperature range. And so given the uh, extremely warm oceans that we've had 
big systems like the Florida Keys Reef Tract and the Great Barrier Reef off Australia have been severely impacted. Um, in some cases, having lost you know 60 to 80 percent of their uh, coral uh, species as a result of coral bleaching and um, different coral diseases that have manifested themselves as the temperature has gotten warmer and warmer. Well, if you kill off the habitat, then you start killing off the species that are dependent on those habitats. And whether or not uh, that has led to any sort of um, mass extinction event, uh, yet I don't know, Ashley may know, but um, it's conceivable that if, if things don't change, if we don't manage to cool things off a bit, that that certainly could could happen. And if it happens anywhere, I would guess that it would be more likely to happen in these tropical coral reef ecosystems than it would uh, be to happen in our more temperate ecosystems. And I'll, I'll toss that one to Ashley. I don't really have much to add other than agree that those hot spots, you know, that are right on that interface uh, are really where we're going to start to see some of these changes. So. Um, and we had another question from the chat for Dr. Smith. Uh, what are some good ways we can as individuals reduce nitrogen pollution? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so to reduce nitrogen pollution, the one way is to eat less meat. That's an easy thing we can do. Uh, limit your fossil fuel use is another thing. It's really, again, with this climate change. Uh, is, uh, there's nitric oxide or NOx gas and that's, um, we don't want that. So <laughs> uh, limiting fossil fuel use, uh, managing fertilizer correctly. Like you don't always need a nice, uh, one of my bio teachers used to say, if you want something smooth, flat and green, you should buy a pool table. It's not something you want to do on your front lawn. <laughs> so managing your fertilizer use, uh, planting native plants is also really, can help capture the right amount of nutrients. So. Those are some good starts. I don't know, Dr. Laney might have something to add too. Um, I, I would just agree with what you just said, Ashley. And I would also say, I mean, I, I don't put fertilizer on my lawn. Uh, our lawn is, uh, I try and keep it as natural as, as possible. Uh, some of my neighbors may not appreciate that, but my philosophy is if it's green, it grows. Um, I do mow it. Um, but heck, if I could get away with it, I'd probably uh, create a uh, rest restored Piedmont Prairie here in North Carolina as opposed to a, uh, a lawn. Um, so that's one thing I think we can do. Uh, use native vegetation that's already adapted to the growing season and the soil conditions that you have uh, wherever you live. Uh, so you don't have to fertilize. And if you do fertilize, then have your soil tested. Uh, so that you know exactly how much to apply and pay attention to when you apply it so that most of it stays where you put it as opposed to running off into uh, the watershed in which you live. Um, and, and I think just general awareness of, of where you live, what your water source is, um, whether you have a septic system or whether you have uh, sewers, uh, you know, all those sorts of things, it, it helps to be as aware as you possibly can uh, to understand how those nutrients get into the waterways in the first place. And just remember, you know, wherever you live in the landscape, uh, any nutrients that you put into the system are going to wind up downstream in the estuary, ultimately, and in the, in the nearshore ocean. So um, I think it's, uh, those are good points to remember. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just it's, like man. sorry. It's just like they Go said ahead. in Finding Nemo, all drains lead to the ocean. So making sure exactly. that exactly. You know. <laughs> uh and a lot of like in our county in particular in Miami Dade County, we are we just enacted a fertilizer ban. Uh I know there's a lot of the Florida counties are thinking about doing something similar with this idea of uh, you know, when you should fertilize so that you don't let all that uh extra nitrogen run off. Um, it's an important part too. Okay, a uh, question for Dr. Laney. Are there any specific uh, 
jobs in the workforce that have surfaced because of the changing and distribution of fish species? I don't know about specific jobs um, that are directly related to fish distribution, but uh, all of those management institutions that I mentioned, which are back on, we'll see whatever slide that was. Zoom back here. Uh, slide six. Uh, all of those management institutions all have websites online and all of them hire biologists. Um, and many of them uh, produce, uh, all of them produce uh, fishery management plans, at least all of the ones from states and territories uh, up that slide, uh, produce fishery management plans. And as a, if you are a, uh, management plan coordinator, then you're going to be responsible for understanding your species. You need to know your species life history. You need to know what makes it tick uh, physiologically. You need to, and not just, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, sexually mature adults, but you need to understand the requirements for the eggs, the larvae, you know, all the different life stages of the, of that species. Um, so, if that's uh, something of interest to you, uh, all of those organizations usually will advertise if they have uh, vacancies. Uh, and if you're going to, uh, if you're an undergrad now and you're interested in getting into uh, fishery management, then you know a degree, all sorts of degrees could could lead you into that career field. Uh, you know, from general biology, marine biology, oceanography, estuarine ecology. Um, and I would say that the, the kind of tools that you need uh, would be um, benefited or the, the tools that would benefit your potential application would include uh, being able to use uh, GIS uh, systems, GIS software, um, certainly your ability to write, your ability to, to speak and give a presentation, all those things would be beneficial because these species coordinators, you know, are not just dealing with the species and the biology. Um, they deal with, uh, for example, I'll pick one, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, for example, has a species management board um, that has three commissioners from each state. It has a technical committee which uh, is composed of all of the senior biologists from each state that deal with a particular species. It has an advisory panel that has uh, stakeholders from uh, non-governmental organizations that are interested in species conservation. Uh, it has uh, recreational fishermen. It has uh, commercial fishermen from, from each different harvest sector. So as a species coordinator, you not only have to know your species, but you have to know people because you have to deal with all of those commissioners, all of those advisors, all of those technical committee folks. Uh, and also you have to know uh, scientists who are working in the field. So uh, it takes a, a, a good amount of skill. And uh, I think it's a, a, good, a good place to be. I think they're very interesting uh, positions. Um, and I actually may want to say something about that too, but yeah, I, I think the, the opportunities are out there. Um, I don't think you will find one that's, uh, you know, that's titled a, a distribution biologist. Uh, but um, again, there are plenty of opportunities for individuals to, to work in the fishery management realm. And, and as Ashley pointed out, aquaculture is a, is a growing industry as well. I know Congress is very interested in seeing us address our balance of trade by increasing our domestic aquaculture capability. Um, and so um, that's another whole uh, area. And Ashley may want to say something about what, what you know you would need to get into the aquaculture end of things. Yeah, I think if, it depends if you want to be a grower or if you want to be on the management side, right? Uh, there's a lot with the expansion of aquaculture. There's a lot of opportunities for people to uh, get new leases, to start to be the next generation of our of farming the waters. Uh, but there's also on land parts, parts to that too. Uh, 
where, you know, it's um, breeding and making sure that you can get your scallops to spawn or your oysters to spawn. So uh, the hatchery management side is also really important for aquaculture production too. And I think like the GIS is definitely a great skill to have and, uh, and knowing some math is also really helpful, so. For sure, and then that, uh, Ashley's last statement prompts me to say that modeling, uh, you know, mathematical models, biological models, ecological models is another very useful skill to have, and that speaks directly to this, the distribution aspect of that question, because the more you can model a species habitat requirements, then the more you can predict what it's going to do in response to climate change. So if you know uh, co complex models like EcoPath with Eco uh, Sim with EcoSpace, then that gives you a, a big advantage for some of these management positions. Yeah, I think it's you know it's not everything is not linear, and we need to stop trying to make everything linear. So being able to model in a nonlinear functions is important. For sure. Okay, it looks like we're about out of time. So I'd just like to thank um, all of our speakers today. That was very good. That was great to hear. I was really looking forward to the, the, the oysters and the fisheries um, talks today. And that's fabulous. We had a lot of great questions. I want to thank Alyssa and Jaya, our interns, for, for heading this uh, talk up today and getting our speakers lined up and, and help coordinate this. They did a great job. And anyone else, just um, we have other programs like this, um, any other uh, nature related programs, you can check on our Sensing Nature page on the calendar page and we'll have other listings for other programs if you want to talk. And if you do think of a question later that you, you want to ask of one of our speakers, you can always contact us at, at Sensing Nature. We can get it on to the speakers too. Um, as well, if you didn't get their contact information, we can we can forward that along to, um, to them as well. So I'd just like to thank everyone for coming out and had a great time. And thank you, um, uh, Dr. Lane and Dr. Smith. That was just fantastic, your presentation. So um, everyone just enjoy the rest of your week. And um, thank you all for, for sharing some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.